Chapter 22, A Modern Business Cycle Theory. So we've learned two theories so far. We've learned the classical theory and we have learned the Keynesian theory. These theories help us explain the business cycles and us as in the Federal Reserve, the monetary policy people, um, the fiscal policy people, the government, these are the people that use these policies but it also helps us to understand where we are in business cycles. So to quickly recap the classical theory and the Keynesian theory that we have gone in depth in the previous chapters, uh, I will do that first and then I will introduce two new theories. The real business cycle theory, which is an enhancement of the classical theory, and then the new Keynesian theory, which builds on top of the Keynesian theory that we've already seen so far. So recap the two that we've already covered and introduce two new uh, theories that uh, are enhancements of the ones that we've covered so far. So the classical theory, remember Adam Smith, the invisible hand, that uh, governments shouldn't interfere, the monetary policy, fiscal policy, useless, no need to do it, let the market uh, clear itself. So this opened up uh, the era of free trade. Um, and we, we saw how the marginal utility of goods uh, in terms of how aggregate demand was generated based on the marginal utility. Like what is the utility of a good at uh, this quantity versus this quantity versus this quantity. That helped build the aggregate demand. The aggregate demand eventually we built the aggregate supply and so aggregate demand, aggregate supply and we had the clearing point where aggregate demand and aggregate supply met and then there was a perfect uh, quantity to build that was needed by the market. And so whenever there was more demand. So when the aggregate demand moved up, right, the inflation would go up, right? And so automatically less and less people would buy it and eventually it'll go down. If it goes way below, then inflation goes down and so more people can buy it. So there's a fluctuation that happens and the market is intelligent, it clears itself. So that is what we learned from the classical theory. Keynesian theory says, hey, all of this works and this is fine, I don't refute any of this but this only works until we are in a crisis. If the country gets into crisis, then all of this doesn't work. And so he drew this Keynesian curve where the classical theory works uh, in the first half, it starts to fail in this, this part and then in the Keynesian mode uh, in this zone, the government absolutely needs to interfere. Otherwise what happens is stagflation. What we saw in the 1970s when uh, Richard Nixon introduced price controls. What we saw was that there was sustained inflation, sustained unemployment, and the market clearing forces just broke down. So when that breakdown happens, we need government intervention. And that was what Keynesian uh, uh, people who, uh, so George Bernard Keynes was the one who introduced uh, this theory. Uh, and, and they believe that government intervention is absolutely needed, especially in crisis. And that fiscal policy, monetary policy with, uh, uh, has a huge impact in terms of regulating the market, in terms of stabilizing the output, in terms of having the right level of employment and keeping inflation under check. So now those are the things that we've already covered. So now let's look at the real business cycle theory. So it, it, is, it is also built on top of the classical uh, camp. So there are camps of economics who believe the classical way, the camps of people who believe the Keynesian way, so the real business cycle camp are the ones who are built on top of the classical camp. And they, they are, their logic is again simple. Uh, the the advance, advancement from classical to real business cycle, all, all, all it is is that they, they've incorporated the concepts of microeconomics and which we'll see that the new Keynesian also did the same. What they have done is that they have made expectations rational. We've seen this in the last chapter 21 as to what expectations are. In summary, uh, people's expectations are rational, meaning they're not just backward looking, but they also are forward looking. So that means that uh, people quickly adapt. People quickly change their behavior, their spending behavior, their saving behavior, their consumption behavior, based on the actions that are happening up until the moment, not just backward looking, but they also anticipate the future. So that is the only addition. The only addition is that the classical theory if you add to it rational expectations, then, then we get the real business cycle theory. So I've summarized this in the table here. So real business cycle 
uh, it still assumes prices and wages to be flexible, meaning the market's clear, but then the only thing that's changing is that it has rational expectations, right? So if you add rational expectations, you get the real business cycle on the classical theory, but if you add the rational expectation on the Keynesian model, you get the new Keynesian model, right? The new Keynesian model basically is a rational expectation. But again, the key difference between classical and Keynesian is that they expect in classical, the prices are flexible and then the market's clear instantly. The news spreads instantly. People change their behavior instantly. Keynesian said, hey, no, no, no. There's information asymmetry. There's switching, there's menu switching costs as an example that they give. Basically, they say that people don't really adapt as quickly and then prices are sticky. You can't really fire everyone instantly. You can't lay out, lay down, you know, uh, get rid of all of your inventory. You can't uh, shut down all of your plants because you don't need them. It is sticky, it takes time. So that's the camp. Um, so if you add to the Keynesian camp, the rational expectation, meaning people uh, have forward-looking expectation, not just backward-looking, then you get the new Keynesian camp. Um, the, the key supporting theory is uh, sticky prices, sticky wages, rational expectation. Both of these are basically the only adaptation is they have added rational expectations. So if you add rational expectations, you get the new Keynesian model. Um, and the other point of difference is that uh, the real business cycle or the classical model, they only think that the aggregate supply is what drives uh, output and, and equilibrium changes. There is no impact of aggregate demand. And so what happens is if uh, long range aggregate supply only shifts if there's a shift in productivity. Remember the function y equals a k t, right? y equals a k t, right? So which we saw the production functions and the productivity factor a, uh, capital and labor. Um, productivity a is what drives. And so their entire thesis is that supply is what drives um, the output and inflation and everything. Uh, but here, Keynesian also thinks about supply and also thinks about demand. And so that's another key difference, right? They only think about uh, uh, supply. Here, they also think about supply plus demand um, in both Keynesian and New Keynesian, right? So now let's look at uh, when aggregate, uh, long run aggregate uh, supply goes up, right? Output goes up, but then inflation goes down. This is very counter. That's one of the uh, issues that we see because inflation typically goes up when output goes up, right? Prices go up when there is more demand for it. But in their theory, uh, classical theory, which is where it falls short, is inflation actually goes down as output goes up, right? So that is what this this inflation this this shows. Um, in the new Keynesian model, uh, if there's an increase in productivity, if there's an increase in productivity, what happens is aggregate supply goes down. When aggregate supply goes down, but due to productivity increase, the inflation goes down, right? So we see the aggregate supply goes from aggregate LRAS, LRAS1 to LRAS2. And so overall, when the supply goes down, inflation goes down, but primarily it's driven by productivity. So that's the key difference. Uh, and here, if we see, um, if when an aggregate demand goes up, product, and overall inflation goes up, right? So supply, when it goes up, inflation goes down, aggregate demand goes up, uh, it moves, the aggregate demand curve moves from 81 to 82, and uh, if it is an anticipated, so that's another difference, if there's an anticipated change or an unanticipated change. If it's an unanticipated change, then, then the output goes way up. But if it's unanticipated pay, change, then output goes from Y1 to Y3, but for unanticipated it goes from Y1 to Y2. Similarly for inflation, right? So, so the key difference, if we see, is also not just expectation in price and wages, but also if it's an unanticipated expand, expansionary policy, right, when, when the demand goes up, um, what happens here is that uh, in an unanticipated uh, expansion, um, the inflation goes up moderately, but uh, in an anticipated, inflation goes up uh, significantly, uh, and output goes up uh, moderately. So when, when, when things are unanticipated, um, the reaction is much more massive. Uh, but when it is anticipated, the output goes up 
um, less because of rational expectations. Similarly, in, in, in anti-inflationary policies, which we will see here, so what happens here in real business cycle, when there's an anti-inflationary policy, like let's say uh, the Federal Reserve um, uh, does monetary tightening. So when they do monetary tightening, aggregate demand goes down. Aggregate demand goes down, inflation drops. Similarly, in Keynesian model, um, traditional Keynesian model, um, when, when there's an aggregate uh, demand goes down because of monetary tightening, what happens is uh, it, inflation goes down, but there's also a temporary decline in output. Here there's no output decline in uh, classical theory, in real business cycle theory. Output stays the same, only changes inflation. But in the new Keynesian, when it's an unanticipated, uh, when meaning people did not anticipate the change that the government makes, the fall in output is much higher. Um, and, and then the fall in inflation is lower. But if, when it is an anticipated change, the fall in output is lower. People, people uh, uh, business decision makers, regular consumption don't fall as much because it's anticipated uh, and inflation uh, goes down even more, right? So the inflation reaction is much more, output reaction is tepid, especially when it is an anticipated change uh, and, and vice versa for an unanticipated change, right? And so what we see is that in the new Keynesian camp, uh, the credibility of the central bank is much higher, but it doesn't matter, of course, in the classical model because they are like government should stay out and, and same for the real business cycle where they, they still say prices are uh, flexible and government intervention has uh, no role to play in fiscal and monetary policy. So hopefully this gives us a little bit more of an overview of different types. Think about classical, prices are flexible, wages are flexible, information is quick to disseminate, market is the leader, Keynesian is like, all that is great, but then you add to it crisis situation, think about stagflation, uh, and, and, and the new Keynesian adds to it uh, uh, the expectations which are much more rational, meaning they are also forward-looking, but they also add this two new lens of anticipated policy changes and unanticipated policy changes, and anticipated policy changes impact on inflation, anticipated policy, unanticipated policy impact on inflation. So there's multiple ways in which we can think about how each of these policies are uh, helpful. So the real question then comes in is like, which of these policies are actually <laughs> reality reflecting? Meaning, which one of this is real? So, so it depends. It depends because this was the first theory that got introduced, the classical. It helped the world move forward to free trade. Eventually, when there was stagflation, Keynesian had a huge role to play, it built on top of the classical, and now we have the real business cycle, uh, which builds on classical, and then the new Keynesian that actually has the most relevance today, I believe, in terms of how it also looks at not just the supply, also looks at aggregate supply, aggregate demand, and also um, we've seen how um, you know various new uh, things like the 2008 recession how which which one would which theory would explain that i believe none right uh, but so the the theories advance and so we will see with the background of theories as to how they evolve we will see new and newer theories being developed but there are these two camps market as the leader or the intervention as the leader uh, from the monetary and fiscal side and then they're both developing and they're both uh, um, getting to a stage where newer and newer, more, more clearer, more uh, intuitive theories are being built. And this is an evolving field. So hopefully this gives us an overview, gives us an idea how monetary policy, inflationary policy, demand generation, how it impacts, uh, how the Federal Reserve looks at all of this to intervene, not intervene, how the government looks at all of this to put in the right policy, not put in the right policy, because they have the data. They can actually see like, hey, is my output actually changing? If it's not changing, then they're like, hey, the real business cycle is actually working for us. Hey, is my inflation actually going down? If it's not, then hey, then it's going down way more, then, then you can actually see which one's working. Or maybe there's a fourth one here, a new one that's being made, which will come soon, is my guess. Thank you. So this is the second last chapter. We'll do one last chapter on emerging markets. And there are a few other, but I think we are very close to finishing. This is the last chapter of the book. There's an extra chapter, which is on the web, uh, which we will also cover in the next upcoming videos.